going to start with the introduction of what a Voronoi diagram is and also some motivation for it. So suppose we have n post offices in a city and you basically want to allocate regions based on proximity. So people want to be to assigned to the post office that is closest to where they live. Um, so the idea is that we decompose the plane into these regions such that each region corresponds to a site or a post office such that if you're inside the region of that site, you're closer to that site than to any other site. Uh, so, more formally, given the set of n sites in the plane, or just in the plane of two regions, like I just said, give one region for each site, and then for each point of the region, you're closer to that site than to any other site in the set of points. Is this clear? Okay. Um, so these are sort of a fundamental problem in computational geometry. Um, they're also used in higher dimensions for nearest neighbor type problems. Uh, we're only going to talk about the two-dimensional case where all of your points are in the plane, but just you know, they arise in other contexts as well. Um, and they are a very naturally occurring structure. So you can see sort of the bubbles forming um, on the left, and the giraffes have spots that form this natural structure. And then we have cookies here that you know think about if you had points and then you were to grow circles uniformly out from those points and they emanated, then you would end up with this orbit diagram structure. Um, and there are also variants of these where you can have different points with different weights associated, but we're just going to talk about standard Euclidean distance metric and assume that there's something special going on. Um, more technically, uh, the Borla diagram contains within it more information about the set of points. So for example, if you're familiar with the convex holes, that's actually defined by the outer cells of the Voronoi diagram. So we see how we have these cells that kind of go off to infinity around the boundary. The sites that are representative of those regions uh, are the convex hull of the set of points itself. Um, and then just uh, very quickly, the dual graph in the geometric sense is the Delaunay triangulation, and this is something that's used in graphics for surface reconstruction. It's not super important to understand what this is now for the purposes of this talk, but it is something that is it's, it's important and it is used um, in practical applications a lot. So the idea is that now we want to have an incremental structure. So sites are always changing, and you may want to modify the diagram, and you want an algorithm that will allow us to make updates to this diagram. So for example, say we want to add this site here. Um, you know, in many cases, the effects of the insertion are pretty local. Like for example, here we would just add these edges. Uh, and so most of the graph is not really changed. And the question is, do we really need to update you know, the entire diagram just to implement those few changes that we have in the lower left? I mean, it doesn't really make sense to sweep the entire plane again and to recompute the entire graph. So I'm going to state our main result, and then we'll go into some of the intuition behind it. So our main result is that over a series of n insertions, the average insertion requires square root n changes to the graph combinatorially. So, um, just some background. Voronoi diagrams can be computed in time n log n, which is uh, for computing the entire diagram, but it, it doesn't allow for this incremental update that I've talked about. And there is a, an easy to see lower bound of log n as well, um, which implies an amortized lower bound of log n per insertion, so you couldn't do better than that. And this just follows from the sorting lower bound. So let's say you have a you know, set of uh, numbers, and I put them on a number line here. We could project them up onto a convex curve, say x squared, like this. And now we have a bunch of points in the plane, and then their <coughs> convex hull because convex hull by definition outputs the, uh, the points in sorted order, it also gives you a sorted list of the points. So you can't hope to do any better than n log n, otherwise you would have a faster sorting algorithm. Okay. Um, now just to formally define what I mean by a Voronoi diagram, um, you can see some pictures of it, but it's an undirected embedded graph, and in this case it's in the plane. So we have a planar graph, um, we're going to assume it's three regular aside from maybe these edges that go off to infinity or I've sometimes drawn the vertex there. Um, and 
In this case, it's in the plane and all of the, the vertices have coordinates. Um, and an important thing to kind of keep track of is how are we going to actually represent this graph? Like, how are we going to keep track of it? Because we're going to be wanting to modify it, so it's good to know what our records of the graph look like. And the answers we're going to use is called a doubly connected edge list, or a DCEL for short, and I'm about to go into what that looks like. So, just some terminology. We have here our sites, which we might also refer to as points. Um, so these are like our post offices in the original motivation. We have Voronoi vertices, which are vertices of the graph, because our Voronoi diagram is a graph. Um, we also have faces, which I might also call a cell or a region. This all means the same thing. It's just basically the polygon that you know consists of the region of surrounding a certain site. Um, so then we have this structure, and it turns out we store every edge as two half edges. So you can see here I've taken this edge and split it into two half edges, each pointing in a different direction and each corresponding to a different face. Um, see right here, we have the two faces and we have a half edge corresponding to each of them. Um, and we do this for the entire graph, not just the edge there. And then we basically also keep edges around the perimeter, so we have the convex hole in sort of order. Um, and I haven't really shown this here, but oh, now I've heard it. Uh, we also have pointers, which I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about. Basically, the point of this is that you're always going to be pointing to something that you're next to. <coughs> so, for example, half edges have pointers to the face that they're adjacent to and the next half edge that, is, that they are adjacent to with the sequence, and of course, the verses in there. Um, so, yeah, when I talked about an edge list, um, think of something like this, where for each edge, we, for each half edge, we make unit entry. Uh, can you read that? Okay. okay. So, we have each half edge. Its twin edge is actually the corresponding edge. So, I'm going to start with an example, actually. Um, we're going to look at edge 2A, which is the inside one here. And its twin edge is 2B. So, that just means it's the half edge that's on the other side of that edge. So, that's on the other face. That is adjacent. Is that clear? Um, we keep track of its origin vertex, so just the vertex where uh, it originates. But we don't worry about the destination because we can always just look at the twin edges and create you know, <coughs> that origin. There's a number of other ways we can do this. We also keep track of the edge, the half edge before it on the same face, and the half edge after it uh, on the same face. So we previous and next. And then we have the site or face to which it belongs. Um, you don't have to memorize the entire table or what all of the different things you have to remember are. Just a good thing to remember is that everything basically has a pointer to what's immediately next to it, regardless of what thing it is. Mm -hmm. And that you can basically jump to anything that you're next to in constant time. Um, and any combination of that. And so just I'm going to fill out the other another entry of this too. If we were to do this for edge 2B, which is its twin edge, we have the same thing where you see its twin edge was 2A, our original edge, or in vertex is B2, which is up here. And then again, we have a previous <coughs> edge, a next edge, and then And then you would just fill out this table for the rest of the graph, for every single path. Not necessarily to remember like everything that we're storing, 
just that we can jump between anything that's ne anything you're next to in any sense adjacent incident um, and traverse in that way very easily. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, yeah, I'm not clear. Uh, when you said it's edge, you have, you have, oh, I see. It's the Voronoi vertex. Yeah, so it's a Voronoi vertex. Well, well, there are three. There are three edges. What do you mean by incident? Those going into or those leaving? Oh, the, the one leaving. It's there. leaving, and you can choose arbitrarily. So there might be more than one that's leaving, and it doesn't matter which one you pick. You can pick arbitrarily, because then what you can do is take the twin edge of this, and then you know this one, then you go to next, then you look at that origin, and you, you can find that. You can kind of walk around. Sure. There, in every little way you want to do things, is a cute little sequence that you can go through that will take constant time to be able to you know switch to the next. Uh, constant time would be constant degree. Yeah, so constant time I need to like, advance one if you were to want to go around. So you can traverse, you know, in linear time, but you can also jump basically to anything local in constant time. You know, assuming. Yeah. Um, and it's not difficult to do so. As long as you have the th I have I have two tables, but as long as you have the three tables and they all have pointers between them, it's can be done fairly easily. And these are the, the objects that we're going to be modifying ultimately. Uh, when we do our updates to our board diagram. Okay. Questions? Uh, so we kind of talked about this a little bit, but just to be clear, incremental Voronoi diagrams allow for the insertion of new sites, and they basically allow us to modify the graph and the CEL without actually having to recompute the entire Voronoi diagram. Um, and just uh, generally speaking, in the past, incremental algorithms have been used to just compute the entire Voronoi diagram. Um, so you could just take a point set, take a random permutation of the points, and it turns out that you can add the points this way and use an incremental algorithm, and that usually gives you expected linear time for the uh, I'm not going to go into the analysis of that. But it's good to have incremental algorithms, both because in real life, new sites are being added, um, and it's a step towards getting dynamic form which would allow for insertion and removal. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a really bad example. Uh, let's say we have a point set that looks like this. We have this kind of cone structure here. And I was saying, you said linear time. Expected. Expected linear time. So wouldn't it be expected linear time for the entire thing then? Every time you put in the node? It's expected linear time for the whole sequence because it's expected constant time for the insertion of one point, but this requires that you randomize, so you basically you're given the point set offline, and then you take a random permutation of them. And we actually want to allow for an adversarial sequence, meaning that, you know, in real life, you can't just say, let's go back, you know, you can't, do, uh, you can't randomize you can't the order. Randomize? Yes. yes. You can. Well, okay, go ahead, sorry. You can't. Not there I an online sequence. Yeah, so if they're, if they're arriving in an online sequence, it's oh, meant to I model see. real I life. See. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, so we're going to look at adversarial sequences. Oh. Is, that, is that clear to everybody? Okay. So let's say we want to insert this point. What we're going to end up getting is a diagram that looks almost exactly the same. So we've added this edge here, which, okay, that's a little change. And then, other than that, I have the orange vertices here showing the original positions of the other coronary vertices. And as you can see, the structure of the graph is basically the same, you know, give or take this extra edge. But if we look at this table of where I was keeping track of the vertices, I needed to make a linear number of changes to these coordinates because they all just translated a little bit. And so that's really not very efficient considering that the graph itself is essentially the same as it was before. So, like I said, the vertices move, but the graph structure is basically the same. Is this, this is actually very important, so I want to make sure that this is clear to everybody. Can you say that again for me? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Do you want me to go back through it or can I keep it up like this? Um, yeah, okay. So, basically, this is before, this is after. Okay. And the orange points here are the positions of the teal points here. So I just translated it to, to show. Um, and if you look at the graph, we added this edge here. So yes, we made a little change to the graph that makes up the Voronoi diagram. 
but really, it's a very small change in comparison. I mean, think about the bulk of the graph being this cone thing, right? You, you know, you could generalize it to be much, a much longer sequence that looks like this. But it does change the, the yeah, so more edges, I see where the yellow dots are. Yeah, so the coordinates of the vertices move. But the actual graph itself looks okay. almost exactly the same. Oh, I see. The, the yellow is where they, where they, where they were, used to be. Where they used to be. I got you. So it's really just a shift or a change in coordinates. But the underlying graph has not changed very much at all. So we would like to take advantage of this fact in order to possibly do better. So, and like I said before, recomputing the coordinates of the vertices seems inefficient in this case. Uh, and this, of course, is true, especially if we have subsequent insertions that are similar. Like if we continue to add points like this in a row, then we would have to keep updating all of these coordinates over and over again. And we really would only be making one change here and then dealing with maintaining all of this, even though the graph would be the same. So how can we avoid this inefficiency? So, like I kind of touched on earlier, if we were to choose a random permutation of the points, the expected number of updates per insertion is constant. But we can't do that here, <coughs> because we want the Borer diagram to be dynamic and online. Well, it's not quite dynamic because we can't remove points, but we would like the sequence to be online, so we need to be able to work for a worst case permutation of insertions, which is why we can't use this expected number of updates as constant. Because we could have a situation like that column that I was talking about where if they come in exactly that order, there's really nothing you can do. Well, there is something you can do, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so can we use the fact that the structure of the graph did it change very much? And the answer is yes. Um, so can we avoid recomputing those coordinates? What changes do we have to keep track of? So the idea is that we actually record changes to the graph itself, as opposed to the embedding or the coordinate values. So we count links, which are the addition of a new edge, or a cut is changing an edge's neighbor. So you can think of it as if you were to take an edge and say suddenly now it's uh, adjacent to this other edge, as opposed to before, then that would be a cut. Uh, or even if you just think of a picture of an edge, like cut, like you were to cut it in half, you know, that's actually a better way of thinking of it, even though it's not formal. Uh, so is this sufficient? And it turns out in the case of board or diagrams it is. Because if we look at something like this, um, we have this graph here. This Boronoi vertex is actually on the boundary of these three cells. And that means that it is equally far from each of these sites, and therefore it's the center of their circumcircle. So if we have enough information from <coughs> our other lists to know that these three sites, or these three cells, are next to each other, and we have the coordinates, of these sites, which we do have all of that, then we can easily compute the coordinates of the border vertex. So we actually don't need to update that at all. So in the case where we just had to update those coordinates, we no longer have to do that. We can just remove that entry altogether. So this is not case. This is not the case in all planar graphs, just because of the fact that it's a Voronoi diagram. This factor rises. Um, so it improves this scenario that we were just talking about um, in this special case. But there are some cases that we really can't do anything about it. I mean, the structure of the graph is just going to change. So for example, let's say we have this set of points here, and we add this point in the middle. Well, <coughs> basically we're going to have to do something like this to insert the point. Uh, we're going to have to intersect a linear number of edges. Like, and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. This operation is going to take linear time. Um, so what we're going to do is leverage the fact that most insertions actually don't look like this. For example, if you wanted to try to do it again, then you'd have to end up on one side or the other of this center vertex, and then you would end up only you know, updating some of the things on one side or the other, and you couldn't continue to incur a linear cost each time. So yes, there may be some ins expensive insertions like this, but they won't all look like this. So, Basically, the addition of this center site, which was quite expensive, does make subsequent insertions less complex, where we're considering the cost to be the number of links and cuts that we make. 
So instead of looking to down the worst case cost of insertion, because we can't do anything about that, we instead bound the average number of links and cuts over a worst case sequence of insertion. So we're just going to do an amortized analysis. So what is the amortized <coughs> number of links and cuts per insertion? Uh, and I'm just going to state this a little more formally. For any sufficiently long sequence of end sites in the plane, what's the amortized number of links and cuts needed to maintain the Voronoi diagram after each insertion? Or how long does it take to perform each insertion on average in expectation? And this in expectation is just because we do allow for some randomness, but not in the sequence. It could be internal to the algorithm, though, just a fine point. That, so the ordering of vertices is worst case, so we can't use that that order one expected value with the random permutation, but we can use other forces of randomness, which we do, but we're actually not going to talk about it. Um, so uh, I'm going to switch to using n for the number of vertices, and I might actually conflate the number of vertices, the number of sites, number of edges, because they're all linear in each other because it's a planar graph. So I might kind of use n and have it mean multiple things, but it should be still clear, I hope. Um, is the problem question clear? You think those two are the same problem, just phrased a different way? Um, yeah, I guess one's a more formal version of the other, yes. Um, and I I guess I shouldn't have put this in expectation because it might be confusing based on everything I said, but the point is there is some randomness in the process. It's just that it has nothing to do with the sequence or the arrival. Um, so I'll go into some related work. Um, so Timothy Chan introduced a data structure that can perform nearest neighbor queries dynamically in polyglog n amortized time for insertion. Um, the, the caveat here is that it doesn't maintain the Voronoi diagram. So it will do something to maintain you know, the ability to do these queries. But then if you wanted to print out the diagram, it won't actually keep an updated version of the Voronoi diagram, which is something that we want to obtain. Is this nearest neighbors in the line or nearest neighbors in like constant degree, constant dimension? Or? I believe. It is in it is in higher dimension, I believe. I want to say may we use true results of his. This one, it might be three dimensional because he does stuff with a, a lot of three D convex hole things, and that's I know that's we use that for a different thing, but this might be a different thing. But um, anyway, um, the point is that it doesn't maintain the entire diagram, and we want every single insertion. To, we want the, the diagram to be up to date after each insertion. And it turns out the problem can be solved in log n amortized expected time if the sites are in convex position and they're added in order along the convex hole. Uh, so this is just an extra sort of. What does it mean, convex position? Convex position means that the point set is its own convex hole. Are you familiar with the convex hole of a point set? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if the points are in convex position, then that means there are no points inside the convex hole. They're all on the boundary. So basically, in a very, very restricted The sites being the sites that you're adding in? <clears throat> Pardon me? Yeah, the sites you're adding in. You're and you have to add them in order around your convex hole in sorted order. So they know how to solve the problem in that very restricted case. So I'm going to give a brief outline of just what we intend to do. Uh, define a general planar graph operation that models the insertion of new sites. Upper bound the total number of amortized links and cuts for this operation on a three regular graph, which a Warner diagram is. And lower bound the worst amortized, worst case amortized number of links and cuts. And that, that's a very brief uh, construction that we show. Uh, it turns out that we also do have an algorithm that works in a very restricted case, but I'm not going to go into the algorithm because it requires some geometric machinery that. I uh, don't really have time to explain in this, in this session. So, planar graph operation. So, basically, we think our planar graph operation is defined by the simple closed curve, which I have here in orange. Um, it intersects each edge at most once. The subgraph inside has to be connected. Uh, it doesn't intersect vertices, that's just to avoid degenerate cases and it enters and exits each face at most once. Um, so you can kind of see how this could be used to model 
it. Well, I also ran through the operation, but this defines a sequence of edges, right? If you were to add a direction to it, and basically the sequence of edges is that you kind of walk around the curve like this. Sorry, the, the operation gives you such a curve, by the way? Oh, okay. So I haven't given you the operation, um, but think of the curve as being like an input, but um, we're, I'm going to describe an, an operation, and once I describe the operation, it'll be clear. But this is sort of like an input. You're, you're given a curve and a graph, and then you perform this operation. Um. Okay. So what we do now, the operation goes like this. For every intersected edge, you add a vertex, a boron vertex, at the point of intersection. So you cut this edge and all of the other edges as well. You connect each cut edge to the successive edge according to the, the curve. And you delete the interior subdrive. Um, so this adds the most two vertices, so it doesn't change the complexity of the graph too much. Um, and it's kind of clear, you can see visually, that this operation can perform a site insertion if you have the right curve, for example. That this operation is capable of modeling the insertion of a new site into a, a Warner diagram. Because it creates just a cell like this. Um, and the algorithm that we actually have in the paper doesn't perform it exactly the way I've described, but I just think the easiest way to describe it is, is sort of this semi-algorithmic explanation. Um, so is the operation clear to everybody? Okay. So like I said earlier, our main result is that for any sufficiently large n, um, any sequence of n planar graph operations of this type, which has a specific name, requires n to the 3 halves links and cuts in total, which yields n to the 1 half uh, amortized per insertion, because we're doing n insertions. Um, and further, even though I won't go into it, we do have an algorithm for implementing and storing the changes in order uh, k polylog n, where k is the number of links and cuts that we have. So we have a bound on the number of links and cuts, and then we just have an extra polylog factor in order to actually implement this in an algorithm when the sites are in convex position, which I sort of described earlier. Um, and just, if you missed that definition, uh, so this is a set of sites in convex position, and you can just think, imagine they're nailed into the board here, take a rubber band, and then I stretch it around the outside, let it go, and snap it, and the sites are in convex position if every single site is on the boundary and there's nothing inside. So this implies the amortized insertion time of n to the one half polylog n per insertion. So now all we're going to focus on is just the number of links and cuts and show that that is n to the one half. Can you go back one? Yeah. So, can I, can I take yourself, so, uh, no, forward one. Yeah, so, so, uh, adding that again. Uh, I didn't get it. I, this is, this is the operation that you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye
Um, we have no three points, no three sides are on the same circle, yeah, exactly. so that you end up with three regularities. So you might end up with a bunch mm -hmm. of vertices really close to each other, um, and that is achieved via perforation. Yeah, so it exactly. is just a general assumption that I've sort of glossed over here, but it is a fair assumption to make, um, yeah. especially in the, in the context of computational geometry. Thank you.
so you take the lower of the two quantities. So it's either the number of faces if that's oh, small, okay. or root n if that's small. Okay, yeah. So yeah, no, it's okay. It's, it's a little confusing. But yeah, it maxes out at root n is what okay, yeah. you may be thinking that. Okay. Um, similarly, we have faces that shrink. So, for example, this face is transformed into something like this if we cut it this way. Um, and again, these two edges have to be updated in order to have these as their successor or you know, predecessor in this doubly connected edge list that I was showing you earlier. So, edges were deleted and added, and some cuts were performed, and there was a link done as well. Um, so this is a shrinking face, and we call it a shrinking face because, again, the complexity of the face, or the number of sides of the face, decreases, so the overall potential decreases in the operation cost, the potential decrease. And then finally, we have something like this, and we cut it across, and it turns out when we want to update it, we actually don't need to perform any links or cuts, we just move these vertices. Um, so there were, no, there were no changes to the edges to the combinatorial structure. Um, so we call this a preserved face because it, its potential is preserved throughout the operation. So the key is we actually just want to count, basically, for every face that is either augmented or shrinking, we'll need to perform a constant number of links of cuts, and can we bound that quantity? Um, so large faces do not lose potential when they shrink. So when I say large, I mean larger than square root n because we have this cap on their potential value. But we still have to be able to count their lengths and cuts. Um, so first we're going to focus on breaking up this curve into subsequences um, of just small faces, so maximal uh, subsequences of small faces. For example, something like this. Let's assume that this has size squared root n squared root n, and we have our curve that cuts across this whole thing. We're going to analyze these two subcurves separately. Um, so if we look at these sort of smaller subcurves, uh, turns out we can't have long chains that don't have shrinking faces. And I've given these examples here of basically, you know, if you try to construct augmenting faces and preserved faces together, you can't really get these large structures. You could make one big cone maybe if you put a bunch of preserved faces, but the point is if you put two augmenting faces next to each other, then you're already, you already have degree three in this vertex, and it turns out you really can't do any can't add anymore, so you have to make these constant size structures. So it turns out that basically every augmenting face, give or take, has a shrinking face next to it. Um, and I haven't proven that, but just trust me that this is something that we show. Um, so the intuition is that every uh, subsequence you have amortized constant cost. Um, and the way that works is just because for every augmenting face, or every augmented face, the potential might increase, or it will increase, by one. But it will also decrease by, because of the shrinking face that's next to it. Aside from the fact that we have these big faces where the potential does not decrease. Um, and so that means that every subsequence has amortized constant cost. How many subsequences are there? Well, if you know, these subsequences are maximal sequences uh, without any faces of size root n or higher. And how many faces of those can we have, of that size can we have in a planar graph? And the answer is at most to square root n, because the number of spaces and edges is, well, the number of edges is linear in it. So there are at most n to the one half subsequences. And yes, the shrinking faces decrease the potential, so they balance out this cost. So this is one of the, one of the lines that we have, and we just wanted to show this in general case. And then we have, we add all of those lines up, and then we get the boundary we're looking for. Um, so this is kind of the crux of the upper bound. Are there any questions on this part? Okay, um, I'm just gonna show you the lower bound very quickly. Uh, lower bound eventually one half. Now this is not necessarily for a Voronoi diagram. This is for a three regular planar graph. Um, so this is our example. You don't have to study it uh, too much, but just believe me that if your operation were before I had an orange curve, right now this is dotted blue line. This operation will perform spurred and links and cuts. 
And notice this is a three regular tree with just a boundary drawn around it. So it is somewhat consistent with what we would expect of the Polaroid diagram. But not necessarily. We don't have a point set that achieves this. Uh, but if we do this and we perform the operation, this is the resulting graph. And if you look at it for 20 minutes, I can tell you that these graphs are isomorphic. Um, so that means that it's basically the same graph, and you could repeat this operation ad infinitum and incur the square root at each time. Um, not going to prove it, just it just takes going through with a piece of paper and a pencil for a few minutes and, you know, looking at it. Um, now, the key is, though, I haven't shown any sites here. These are all born reverses, so we don't know if there exists a point set that achieves this. In fact, there probably isn't, because if they're isomorphic, then that means uh, that there are no new faces, so we can't be inserting new sites. We have to somehow account for deletion, which we haven't talked about at all. Um, but it is sort of a next step towards towards getting uh, a lower bound. Uh, so so it looks like even the number of nodes. It is the same. Uh, so. I mean, so you you've thrown in the one on the blue. Yes. So I, yeah, otherwise, I'm going to have to ask you to trust me on this because I don't want to go into too much detail. But I personally verified it, and they are isomorphic to one another. Okay. Um, yeah, I can, I, mean, I can give you a link to the paper if you would like to you know, yeah. go through and count. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> okay. That's your definition of fun. OK, so you can repeat this uh, ad infinitum, and then you would incur a cost of square root n every single time over and over again over the sequence. Um, so the amortization, the amortized lower bound is fair. Um, that being said, like I said, there's no point set necessarily that realizes this. So future directions would be, we have an algorithm that I didn't talk about too much, and it only works on sites that are in convex position. Extending that to work on sites that are you know, not just in convex position would be great. Um, so like I said, the, the lower bound for the number of links and cuts is combinatorial. So we could either you know, somehow restrict the lower bound so that it you know, we only allow for graphs that actually have point sets that realize, or that are realized by that graph in the Warren diagram, uh, which we haven't, we just created a planar graph that's the regular. You know, we have no idea if there's a point set that corresponds to that exact set of assertions. Um, and that's really, that's really all for now. Thank you. gives you the, the curve that you need to do this operation with. Yes. That's the thing that only works when you have things at in convex position, or? So the curve itself um, can work for any arbitrary point set. Does not have to be convex position. But we have to be able to calculate what that curve is. Right, so that's the part. So that's the part that's dependent on, time. So, uh, on convex position. So all the stuff I said about convex position is specific to the algorithm of calculating what is the curve and then implementing it. Um, and that is the stuff that I didn't say anything about, and so it would be understandable that it didn't really come up in any, as any relevant you know, factor in anything I said other than just wanting to be very clear about what our results were. Okay, and then when you're talking about the related work, you said how you want to be able to generate the diagram at every moment, at every yes. is there. But you don't maintain the coordinates of those points. Maybe it's very obvious, but like, how do you get the coordinates from the graph structure? That you, can you do that very efficiently? Yeah, you can do it in linear time. Okay. Um, you would just traverse that whole thing. But the point is you have the information to do it, whereas previous work would actually be lossy in terms of information. Okay. So you'd be able to do nearest neighbor queries. You could say, what cell am I in? But then you couldn't, you don't have enough information to go through and reconstruct the graph. So if you wanted to like print it out, then you'd be, like you just would not have sufficient information to do that, no matter how much computation you wanted. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess you're doing all, so technically you could just repeat the whole diagram, but you know, you couldn't do it in a nice way. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the lower bound that you gave before when you compared it to sorting. Yes. Uh, so the, that lower bound for sorting is if you're going to do a comparison sorting. Yes, it is. Can you not exploit some extra properties of the fact that's a really good point, actually. I almost made a slide on it. So um, 
it turns out that comparison-based sorting is the correct analog to use, and that's because this sort of what we consider to be a primitive operation in the geometric context is called uh, an orientation test. Are you familiar with this? No. So you're given three points, and you say for points one and two, draw a ray emanating from one that goes through two. It's point three on the left or the right. So that's a comparison-oriented sort. Um, and the reason we want to use something like this, as opposed to you know those other tricks that, for example, like bucket sort or things yeah. like that, um, is because we're not expecting our points to be embedded on a grid. There's no assumptions about the granularity of the points that they can be real valued and they can be arbitrarily close to one another. So you need to do a comparison-based operation because it's an R2, not like snap to grid or something like that. But if you were to make assumptions about like you know every point is sort of you know snapping to its nearest integer coordinate or you know whatever granularity you like, then you might be able to exploit some of those tricks. It's a very good question. Yes. Um, do you have any ideas for how to extend this sort of data, like this sort of these sorts of ideas to work for uh, deletions? Or because like I mean I guess yeah. the operation you find is like very seems very specific to insertions. Is there anything like analogous for deletions you've considered? Or to be honest, we haven't considered it. Um, yeah. This was considered to be like our first step, and then once we had it, we were just like yeah. happy with it. Um, I think even I mean that is a very important problem. I think more important is actually getting the general case of not context position because the difficult case with deletion is actually you know you have something like in the middle, like in that case where I showed you at a point in the middle, which is very not convex, um, then, you know, removing that again and retrieving the previous graph. Um, I don't know if, like, something for, like, persistence would work, but the problem is right now, we require the sites be in convex position because we require that the Voronoi graph be a tree. Um, and that's kind of the main hurdle, I think, that we should overcome first, and then you can start worrying about the niche. Does that answer your question? No, Okay, but you're right, yes, like, absolutely, that's an important thing to do, and that would be like the holy grail, mm -hmm. is to get completely dynamic more on our And also just like, so you have like, you guys will log in lower bound, and yes. then, and like, which is, you know, regardless of other, and then like, your algorithm gets like, edit three halves, and it's yes. kind of like, I mean, you're, you're, you don't have quite a counter example, like, well, I mean, I guess you kind of, no, not quite. Well, the example yeah. is for a yeah, general right. planar graph operation. But we don't know if there's a point set yeah, that corresponds to it. In fact, I can tell you if we only allow for insertion and we don't allow for deletion, that that lower bound doesn't work. Ah, I see. Um, oh. Because it's isomorphic. And so if you add a point, you want to add yes, a set. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, there are some pieces like for this point Voronoi diagram for your guarantee to get a tree, maybe it'll work. They don't know. Because there are tricks that can be done to show existence of point sets by like projecting under parabolas and things like that. Um, but I'm not sure how they work for, for the farthest point for our diagram. Only case where I can see that construction possibly working. Okay. Well, yeah, my, my, my question Sorry. is actually just like this, this, this is probably pretty vague and it's asking you to sort of make a guess, but like do you think that end of three half is probably close to the right answer and all is close to the right answer? Or is there like a general consensus or is it still pretty wide open? I feel like it should be n log n, and I think okay. the fact is this is surprising because it gives n the three halves. Um, but then again, I don't want to say that it's <laughs> necessarily n log n because I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the lower bound was surprising when we first encountered it. So we would have to probably introduce some new machinery altogether to, to get closer to the end. Or, sorry, to get around the end.